Welcome back to the Fund Monitors Meet the Manager series. The Prime Value Emerging Opportunities Fund was started in October 2015 and having just passed its five year anniversary has posted very strong returns for its investors. And Prime Value have done a great job outperforming the ASX 200 total return index by 5.7% over the five years and the Small Ordinaries Accumulation Index by 3.7%. The funds have done very well in both up and down markets, providing investors with very strong outperformance during positive markets and managing downside risk during negative markets. I'm joined today by Richard Ivers, the Portfolio Manager for the Prime Value Emerging Opportunities Fund. Richard, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Damon. Nice to be with you. Uh, Richard, the fund has had strong outperformance since inception and, and has done exceptionally well in the last 12 months. Um, mm. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've generated such strong returns? Yeah, thanks, Damon. Yeah, it's, uh, it's almost the, uh, it's actually just the five-year anniversary for the fund. So it was in October and I've managed it for almost three years of that, that five years. And it's been really good performance, as you said. So in 2019 calendar year, we produced a return of 32% and that was versus the index of 21. And then this, so that was an up market. And then this year, which is more of a down and tougher market, we're, the 2020 calendar year, we've produced a return of 10% after all fees. And that's versus the index, which is down 4%. So um, the, the good thing about that is I think performance in both up markets and down markets. And we've done that really by generating um, consistent returns and focusing on um, you know, good consistent returns, not trying to hit it out of the park. So when you look at the constituents of the, um, of the returns, so it's been very broad based. So uh, over the last 12 months or so, we've had uh, 10 stocks that generated a return of greater than 1%, but only one stock that's had a, a return worse than negative 1%. So, um, yeah, as I said, broad based and, you know, it's a quality portfolio with an market, average market capitalization of around about $2 billion for, for each company. So decent sized businesses established, um, they're all profitable and uh, we tend to avoid um, a crowded trade. So we don't have anything in the buy now, pay later space at the moment that's hot. Uh, you know, we don't, we tend to avoid the sort of the new, the new shiny thing and focus on areas where we can find value in the market. Okay. Um, the fund has a focus on, on having a low-risk approach. You know, I mentioned in my introduction that the fund's done incredibly well in, down, in negative markets since inception. Um, what process do you employ as a team to, to, to manage that sort of outcome? Yeah, so um, as, as you'd see in that preamble, so in, in months when the market had a negative return, we've outperformed 85% of the time. So very much about uh, capital preservation, which goes to the core philosophy of the way we manage money. Um, we are a long only fund too, by the way, we don't short companies. Uh, but we manage risk in three main ways. And the most important way that we manage risk is the, is the quality of the, of the businesses that we put in the portfolio. Um, that's, that's the core. But we also screen out um, a higher risk areas. So for example, we don't invest in mining companies. Uh, that's not my area of, of, of expertise and we play to our strengths. And it's also hard to forecast the earnings for those sort of businesses because they're heavily dependent on commodity prices, which are very, very difficult to forecast. We also don't tend to invest in lottery ticket type businesses where the return could be very big, but the risk is also very large. We sort of, we take more of a sort of a, uh, a tortoise and hare type approach. And we're sort of the tortoise, dare, dare I say, we're actually generating very strong returns in being that tortoise type approach. And then lastly, we have, um, seven key risk factors that we monitor um, constantly. Uh, and that's monitored by a person external to me, so in the operations team of our business. And that looks at things like correlation risk, liquidity risk, uh, and the quality of the overall portfolio. So to ensure that there's no style drift and there's no risks coming into the portfolio that, that perhaps we're not aware of. Uh, 2020 has been a pretty tough year for some investors and uh, a pretty good year for some others, as they say, uh, volatility breeds opportunity. Um, looking into 2021, um, how are you and the team focusing your research efforts? What are the sorts of things that, and trends that you're looking at? Yeah, so when, when first and most importantly is when we're not changing our investment style or process. So it's, our process is all about um, a, a heavy um, uh, company visitation and meeting program. Um, so we're still doing around about three meetings a day with companies. So a broad range of companies to find new ideas um, because we are in a changing environment. Um, and it's interesting, we look back at the, I look back at the top five holdings 
of um, in January in the fund. And of those top five in January, five, uh, three of them are still in the top five as we speak now. And those, those three equity trustees, News Corp and a New Zealand listed company called Mainframe. So, um, and then that represents the, the quality of the business that we hold. They tend to be pretty resilient and perform well through any economic cycle. But then some of the interesting stocks that I find um, at the moment as well, that some of this might be interested in, um, I think SG Fleet looks interesting right now. It's at a valuation multiple that's an all-time low. And the earnings are actually starting to grow and really improve. So there's some, some you know, the, the, the valuation is very low and the earnings are growing again after a, a tough earlier 2020. And then, as I mentioned, News Corp as well is one of our top five holdings. And at the moment, um, it's 62% shareholding in REA or realestate.com, together with its cash holding, pretty much are equivalent to the market cap of the business. So you're getting a whole bunch of, of other assets effectively for free, including assets like Dow Jones, which owns uh, the Wall Street Journal, one of the premier newspapers globally in the finance industry. Um, and then HarperCollins, the book publisher, and Move, which is the equivalent of Domain here in Australia, so the number two uh, real estate portal in, in, in the US. So very attractive assets, which are effectively getting for free. And then EQT is another one we find interesting as well, which is a beneficiary of uh, the Royal Commission. And so the movement to independent trustees uh, so we're seeing more and more of that, and it, it acts as an independent trustee for um, superannuation and, um, and fund managers. And so it's got a long pipeline of wins that it has been winning, will continue to win. And there's also a perpetual, perpetual trust side of the business as well on its private client side, which is, as its name suggests, perpetual. So very long duration earning streams. Um, so that's a really high quality asset that we own as well. With it. It's been sold off in recent weeks. It looks really interesting. Um, one of the things out of interest that I noticed about the fund, and I think this is uh, very interesting for, for a lot of investors, um, the benchmark that, and I, I mentioned mm. beating um, indexes, but the benchmark that you use for the portfolio um, is an absolute return of 8%. Um, what's the thinking behind that? Yeah, that's, it is. It's well, a little bit different in having an, an absolute benchmark, being a long only uh, small cap fund. And it really comes down to the foundation of Prime Value. So Prime Value started around 22 years ago as a family office, and it also accepts external money and has over that whole 22 years of its history. But a core philosophy within Prime Value is the focus on capital preservation and minimising downside risk. And so um, uh, as part of that, we believe an absolute return is much more important. So aligning the, the, the incentives with the being the benchmark with the, the core philosophy of, uh, of our organisation. And so um, when we invest, we're not just trying to beat an index, we're trying to generate a positive uh, investment return uh, and beat that 8% per annum in absolute terms. So aligning uh, the philosophy with the incentives and then the outcomes that have come from that have been very interesting as well. So... Over the almost three years that I've been managing the farm, we've generated a return of 15% per annum uh, after fees. And that compares with the index, the small orders accumulation index of 2% per annum. So we beat the index by about 13% per annum over that time. And uh, also importantly, the risk has been lower. So as measured by volatility, whereby the standard deviation of monthly returns. So the fund is 20% less volatile than the index. So we're getting a higher return at a lower risk profile. So you've got that alignment of philosophy, incentives, which are producing really strong outcomes. Um, and we recognise we are different to most other funds in having that absolute benchmark, but we believe a lot of investors will find that um, a good structure that appeals to them. So we like to be different. Richard, by the time this video goes to market, the US election should have been decided. Uh, do you see or foresee any volatility as a result of um, uh, either of the potential outcomes for the US election going forward? As you said, the results will be, uh, will be um, decided by the time we, this goes out. But, I mean, the, the key thing that you want is, is for there to be a clear winner. You don't want there to be a disputed outcome. That's the key thing on either side. Um, historically, elections haven't had a big 
influence on markets over the longer term. They do, do, do cause volatility in the short term. So the outcome may well influence, um, you know, the next couple of weeks market returns. But we, we very much look out three to five years. And so things like, like elections, look, they are definitely um, something you have to look at and focus on and understand the policies of the two different parties. But we tend to think more about it at the stock level. And in our portfolio, there's not a huge amount of influence or impact that's likely from the elections either, either way, in our view. Um, sage Vice Richard, uh, especially looking at stocks. Um, thank you for joining me today. Uh, appreciate your time and good luck uh, for 2021. Thanks for having me, Damien. Appreciate it.